our time back to the planet, it's possible to fit in some self-care, making margin recognize that we have limits and that we are human beings and that we can die. We are not we are not all capable, we are not all awesome all the time. We are finite human beings with a need for boundaries to keep our lives in check. While the idea of balance may be impossible, in a graceful harmony we can connect with Christ, with our family, with others, our work, and most importantly with ourselves. Whatever that looks like now is the time to find out. Too many of us are busy taking care of everyone and everything else but ourselves. It's in the margins that we get to walk with God and experiences the peace that he gives. It's in the margins that we fuel ourselves for the days ahead. For me, um, self-care looks like just, you know, tucking in my blanket or in my, in my bed and just reading a good book. Sometimes it's, it's what I do. It doesn't accomplish anything in particular or anything on paper. But it's just, it's just good for the soul. Life, life isn't just about what we produce, but life is also about what we become. The margins make room for growth, for breath, and for life. Our souls, our hearts, and our strengths thrive when we refuse to fill up every inch of our days and months. When others peek into our lives, they will see rest and labor in harmony with Jesus Christ our King. As we follow Jesus, we give up running our road. Instead, we seek, we seek Him for our next steps in our calendar, commitments, and our rest. So, take the time to breathe, make a margin, and just relax, give your love. Give yourself some self-care and look up at God for us. God bless. Amen.
the whole Atri Manor scene, people rebelled against God, people didn't trust God. And this is why today we are struggling with a restlessness and even a rebellion against God. And you might say, okay, rebellion, you know, those outside of the church. Could somebody please close the door, thank you. Uh, outside of the church, uh, not in the church. We, we don't rebel against God. And we want to talk about that. But you know, this is the problem. Sin is the problem. Okay, so we are going, uh, there are, I think, three chapters that are covered from numbers. Uh, we are not normally we read passages from the Bible and then we talk, but this is too long to read all of them. And this, these are well-known stories, so I don't think that we really need to read them. <coughs> so if we go to Numbers chapter 11, So what did happen in Numbers 11 verses 1 to 15? If someone could summarize, yes. There's a complaint of Israelites. They yes. miss they miss the whole life. So the is the Israelites were missing things. But uh, we need to also remember that when the Israelites left, some Egyptians left with them, they were not slaves. Okay. Uh, how much did they have impact on the Israelites here? The Bible doesn't tell us, but I'm sure that they play part. But okay, so they are complaining. What are they complaining about? So they didn't have food, right? They didn't have food. God didn't provide food for them. Did they have manna at this time? Yes, they do. Okay, they did have manna. So they had food. Uh, they Heavenly food. food, you know, you can call it. Yeah, meat. Uh, they are missing meat. They are missing meat. They are missing cucumbers. Melons and so on and so on. It was wonderful time in Egypt, right? They really enjoy being there. Wonderful food, good holidays, nice salaries. They have selective memory, it looks like. Uh, why do we after some time when we think about some bad periods in our life, uh, it's not so bad anymore. Why do we do this? And we, we don't want to think about that. We don't like to think about that. So we diminish it. Because you know it was hurting us. And we concentrate on positive things. Not all of us. Some constantly concentrate on negative, negative things and problems. And always remember that. But you know, we like to think about in a positive way about those situations, events. Selective memory. They were slaves. And being a slave is a hard thing. Yes, they had food. More variety than in the wilderness. But this is true. This is true. But they forgot that they were slaves. And if they didn't provide and do enough, they were beaten. No mercy. So, they complained. What, 
was it only about food that they complained? Or there was something behind that? Pastor, we are talking about uh, uh, very numerous people and uh, we are just taking uh, some of those important things that the Israelites is getting in. And this complaint, we are talking about that because it's against God and it's against the purpose of God. That's why we are talking about this. Otherwise, this is a senseless a point to talk about. I know in that number of people, lots of them are obedient. They are pleasing to God and they just obey what Moses had said. But because in a big group like this, even 1% of that would complain and would reiterate the complaint like we better be slave and go back to Egypt. We have a nice life there. Remember that this number of people, not every one of them, might experience living, might experience uh, degradation or uh, any like racism, something like that. They might have a better life out there. That's why it's for me, if I have a good life here, I don't care if I'm a slave, provided I met all the necessities that I want in my life. But this is my life because the order of the Lord to take in general, to, to, to move them in a place where they could not be contaminated with Egyptian uh, tradition, so they were taken, but many of them who are having a nice life there might be easy time or they might have some complaints from the beginning. And that is why I said even 1% of that would voice out their complaint. It is so much in the ear of Moses. So we have situations like um, uh, three leaders that uh, I don't remember their names in English that complained uh, and you know then you know they were separated and earth swallowed them. You remember the story. Uh, God didn't punish a whole uh, people, all, all Israelites. So because it was a small group here. It looks like that it was a much bigger group. Maybe it started with a smaller group, probably. It doesn't say. Maybe it started with you know, the Egyptians that joined Israel who had a good life. They were not slaves. We don't know. Uh, but uh, however it started, the rest of the Israelites just followed it and believe it. So, as Elder said, you know, the background, the, the main problem was God, not food. No, God, what did you do? No, we, it was nice over there, and now you know you promised, promised land. Where is it? So, and. Uh, I don't have time to check you know, if in this story God said this is against me. But you know, from time to time when these things happen, God would say, you know, Moses or whoever, uh, whatever the situation was, whoever the prophet was, you know, it's not about you. Like Samuel and when they ask the Israelites to get a king. God said, no, this is about me. It's not about really you. So their problem was they didn't trust God. That He is going to take them to the promised land. That right now they are not in the promised land. 
they are on their way toward the promised land. And you know, things are not going to be the same right now and in the promised land. They are going to have variety of food, yes. Not just mana and sometimes a few other things. But you know, when God gives something, even if it is one food all the time, it is satisfying and fulfilling. Pray it on. I think one understands how long was it there who was that complaining? Because the Muslim kept, it's got to get better than this. It's got to get better than we can move forward. There wasn't cooked yet. We don't know when this is going And so when we said that, look, hang on, if we stay there, all building, things might have got better. We don't know. And like you said, it's not a small room. And it's not fair. But keep thinking, you know, about your work with politics. The big lie. What can you call it? They believe it. And here we have a small group telling them, you know, we hate what we see. The promises, the promised land, we haven't got the promised land. But what do we have? This man. We have good things, and this man got better. And I think if we are human beings, you know, we can't sit, we can't catch up and say, what happened to me? Because it's going to happen to us. Couldn't it? So this has happened between one year and two years after they left Egypt. Because in year in, in chapter 13, they went, you know, to uh, they send um, spies, uh, and we know that this was two years. And then you know, extra 38 years after that in the beginning. So after a year or two, you know, this is where we are. Thank you. So the main point is this restlessness is against God, not trusting God. Yeah, this, uh, this story is really upsetting God in the first place. Even at the beginning of the, the Exodus, God promised them to have 40 days and 40 nights journey to reach the promised land. But then 40 days was over and there are so many obstacles on the road. But the point is God was showing them for those who are unbelieving, God is trying to show them miracle that there is God among them. But these people are really stubborn. They don't want to believe in God. They don't want to believe the things that they do not see. What they see is because, remember, the land or their land in Egypt was a fertile land where they live abundantly in terms of things, material things. They have fertile land. All their cattle, all their plants are being blessed by God. But then they forget about God. They forget about this thing. They just see that they will belong to Egyptians. And they might be somehow adopted that they are Egyptian. They don't know where they come from. Because over 400 years, so these people have been like how many generations from the promise of God. And now, since they left, since they left Egypt, they already had this negative thought that they might be, you know, their life, lifestyle will change to, to bad or to worse. That's why after this uh, 12 spies despite the land, then they complain not so much because here, yeah, it's better for us to die in Egypt and being a slave than to die in the wilderness that is being helpless. At least in Egypt, we can do something. We die normally, but here we will die in hunger. That we are, we cannot do anything. How big is the God actually? Because at the very beginning of Moses, the other day cry out to They're begging for help. You know? He said, Someone going to send me down to Saul. Most of the discussion is gone. I can't do because this is this. And God's other day cry, I 
so they're suffering. No one can help them. And what do I do? The black man, the reason. Because he's acting. Because that's his Bible in there as well. You can see people here. They asked for help. When help came, started complaining. You know, it doesn't seem right to does it? They asked for the help. And when it does come, he starts to complain. He said, Why? He said, Why? He said, Why? He said, So he suffered from it. So you can see why, you know. Okay? So. They complained, and uh, what was God's response? Uh, be before God's response, Moses was saying, God, you know, I cannot do it on my own. This is too much for me. So what was God's response to people's complaint and Moses saying, you know, God, you know, I need help? Yes, God did it according to what they want, and they see what happened. <coughs> they asked for me. But they knew, but they didn't realize that this meat that they are missing is something uh, that might affect their health. The manna, even though this is a tasteless food, but this is a complete nutrient for the needs of the body. But they are just looking the part of, you know, a portion of the nutrients. They are missing meat. They are missing cucumber. Things that might be for uh, for relaxed uh, people, but they were in Exodus. They are traveling. They don't know where, uh, what type of life they are having. But the point is this: when there is or oh, there are people who are unbelieving, it is very contagious. They keep on murmuring, and when they talk to one person, to another person, it will uh, spread the negative. And this is what happened to them. So even when they heard that the people in uh, the promised land are weak, they are very, very strong, and the world is strong. It is very easy to, to talk about negative things because our nature is simple. Our nature is to, to believe what we see. But we don't really trust God. And we know for ourselves that we have been sinner. Because of our sin, God will not give us. And they knew about that. And so, unless they behave themselves and they go straight to God, then they can claim for the promise. And that is why their unbelief bringing them the negative impact and belief to the negative news that the spies had uh, spoken. Okay, so God said, okay, you know, I'm going to give you meat. Not for one day. Not for two days, for a whole month. And for Moses, he said, okay, yeah, you're correct. This is too much for you to do on your own. I'm going to give you 70 people to help you lead the Israelites. And uh, when they uh, got uh, meat, the way they approach it, uh, instead of to have you know great moments, to say God you know forgive us you know, how they approach it, you know, it was still continuing uh, complaints, uh, rebellion that uh, God sent a plague that struck uh, some of the people, probably those who were startups who cause all of this but we don't know the Bible doesn't tell us. Okay now Moses has 70 people to help him. Now we have another problem. Not with the Israelites, yes. the whole nation. Now we have a problem with the two people. What is the problem? Jealousy. 
jealousy. And who are they? Not, rela not, not related to Moses, you know, somebody out there, not important persons. Who are they? Miriam and our siblings. Moses' siblings. Okay. Aren't you happy when somebody among your family is successful? Shouldn't be. It's, it's your family. You know, uh, I, I, I'm not watching uh, Euro 2020, uh, but you know, sometimes, it happened a few times, we were my wife and myself were walking and we could hear, you know, people cheering and, you know, uh, and we knew it was England playing, I don't remember against whom at that time, uh, and when England won, it was like, ah, you know, did they play? No. Did they win? No. But it's their country. So, when one of your family member is successful, Shouldn't we be happy? Uh, but what do we have here? Okay. It was okay, you know, that Moses was a leader to a certain extent, but then there are other 70, you know. And you know, their role is now not that visible, not that important, although Aaron is still high priest. And, um, uh, but when they complain, they don't mention really those 70 people. It's, you know, jealousy, it's selfishness, uh, particularly Miriam, because she got lepers. Uh, but both of them, you know, were guilty. Restlessness, yes. Like what they really need is the one thing. So what did they want? He says it was the grandfather, but he said it was not the one. So what did they want? They, they did want meat. Yeah. But it wasn't just that. <laughs> they they didn't trust God. They wanted to be already promised land. So not in God's time. But, you know, in their time. We want it now. And how many of us do the same? I want it now. Two days ago, two days ago, what's the bigger thing? That makes sense. Thank you. So, restless, medium, arrow, and restlessness. They were missing something. When God asked Moses to take this role, did, they, did Moses say, finally, you know, what took you so long? What did he say? No, no, I, I, I don't want it. I, I, I don't want it. And, you know, eventually, you know, he accepted and he did what God, and was doing what God was telling him. But, you know, it's not what he wanted. And uh, here, he, so Moses had a peace. This is, this is what I'm trying to say. He had rest in Christ, in God. Miriam and Aaron, <coughs> at least right here, didn't have that. Because when we have peace in God, what does happen? If we don't have some things, we have God. It's not wrong to have those desires, but if they never happen, we have God. So we have peace, rest in Christ. Yes, we know that you know it's not perfect. I'm going to preach uh, a little bit on this topic. We are almost finishing the book of Mark. But you know, this is the problem, restlessness. And it comes from sin. So we see not only with the Israelites, we see it with Miriam and Aaron.
and God had to um, react. And his response, reaction was so clear because Miriam got leprosy. That, you know, no questions that what they did, Aaron and Miriam, is wrong. And it's not just about Moses, it's again against God. Because God appointed Moses. God appointed those 70 people to be leaders. But when we don't trust God, we are restless. So, it's not about not loving things. I'm going to talk about that in a sermon. It's about loving God more than those things. So, you love melon, uh, you love uh, onion, garlic, whatever they were mentioning. Uh, that's okay. As long as you love God more than that. And that was their problem. They were loving these things more than God. They didn't trust God. And we need to, you know, through somebody mentioned, uh, while we read these things, we need to think about ourselves. Because if we think just about them and we don't apply it in our life and we don't realize that we have the same problem, then this is waste of time. We didn't do what we were supposed to do. Study stories about them and then you say, okay, now I see myself. And now, you know, God helped me to apply this or that. You saw Moses. I think very saw Moses. His, his family, you know, the father, he said he was only really yoked. He passed away outside, you know. And so he had all the students come back here. And his family as well. You know, the kids were very well to our drink. But it can't be pleasant for him to fight all the people on the city and his own family, his sister and brother, but against him. This must be a good thing to talk. Yeah, you know? Doesn't help. Doesn't help, does it? Thank you. Uh, so, the title for this week was Restlessness and Rebellion. Uh, for Tuesday, the title is Restlessness Leads to Rebellion. So, uh, Elder mentioned uh, what happened after. So, this is second half of Numbers chapter 13, uh, chapter 14. Uh, so, they were at the border of Promised Land. They sent 12 spies, they came back, and uh, uh, which kind of land was it? Was it good or bad land? Was it exactly as God said, or you know, it's not what you promised? It was good land. Good land. Better than Egypt, because in Egypt you had Nile, little bit, you know, just on both sides, and then desert. And could somebody please close the door? Please? So they came to this land, it was like, wow. And the spies said, let's go, God is with us. Two of them said that. Ten of them, and they were louder, okay? Said no. So what were they saying? Could somebody just remind us? They are telling the truth. <laughs> the truth, which is the negative part. The wall is high, the people are gay, and they look like grass offered to them. That is true, but they never could see that that God is a lot bigger than those people. They forget about God. They think they see themselves. They cannot conquer the land. So what will we do? We don't have any 
on horses, they don't have any weapon that could battle against them. They completely forgot them. God is with them. And it's very contagious to speak the negative side. So, some aspects were true. There were some who were giants. Not all of them were giants. Uh, many of the people there were you know, like them, okay? but some were giants. Uh, true, some cities had big, small, big walls. Uh, so there is some truth. But you know, restlessness when you don't trust God leads to a rebellion. And here we see rebellion. So in our life, we can experience the same. We have some desires, which can be good desires, but either it's not for us, or it's not the right time, like in their case, uh, it wasn't the right time, and then, you know, we are not happy. How can we have peace and joy? I'm not talking about happiness. Peace and joy in even problems. And many of us, you know, it's not that we have a problem, but you know, our desires are not fulfilled. And we are restless. And that's sin, because we don't trust God. And then, that leads to a rebellion. So we do things that we shouldn't do. It's a rebellion. And it, doesn't have to be open like this. Nobody might notice that, but actually we are you know, complaining to God, we are rebellious against God. So we need to think about ourselves, because restlessness leads to rebellion. Rebellion leads to where does rebellion lead? What did happen to them? Death. It leads to death. So they rebel against God and say, we are not going. And God said, okay, you are not going. 38 years back to the wilderness, your children are going to go into the promise. Uh, so they rebel, and when God changed the plan because of their rebellion, they continue to rebel. I said, oh, we have sinned. Were they really sorry? Uh, they were sorry that you know, the, of the consequences, not of the actions. And they rebel against, again. And was it, don't go, God is not with you. But we are going. And many of them died, were killed. Restlessness leads to rebellion. Rebellion leads to death. We might not die when we rebel against God, but spiritually we are dying. So, and if we are struggling, whether it is trusting God or whatever it is, pray, pray, and pray until God gives to you. It might take time, not because, you know, God is busy or delaying. It's just, you know, we are the problem. But continue to pray and say, God, you know, I'm trying and you know, I'm failing. I want to trust you and I'm failing or whatever else it is. Okay, we have how many minutes left? A few minutes left, right? Uh, Wednesday part. God said to Moses, okay, step aside, I'm going to kill them all uh, and I'm going to make the nation from you. And Moses says, oh, good, you know, just do it. It was hard for Moses to do it, but you know, you can see the love that he had for these rebellious people. And he interceded. He interceded for uh, Miriam. He interceded and Aaron. <laughs> and he interceded for 
the whole Israelites. And Moses is um, here you know, like, like Jesus. Jesus is interceding for us. Because when people come to a rebellious state, they don't realize where they are. And they need somebody to intercede on their behalf. So if you see somebody rebelling against God, even when, you know, when there is restlessness with that person, pray for that person. Of course, if it is yourself, you, know, you pray and you ask other people to pray for you. You know, in this context, you know, pray for other people who experience restlessness, because restlessness leads to rebellion, rebellion leads to death. Okay. Time to finish. Uh, anything else that you would like to mention from this lesson? Yes, uh, if, if, if we can remember that this is uh, in the uh, span of two years, the other reached the border. And we know that the story tells us that in 40 years they were wandering. So could you imagine the experience of Moses? Maybe during that time he's still strong. During the sending spy, because it was still uh, on the second year of their exodus. And now people started to murmur, like, let's go back to Egypt. You're about there on the brink. You're about there to enter. Some already entered as a spy, and here bring the bad news. The thing with these uh, Israelites is because they are just guided by God, their direction. If they abide in God, they go closer to the promised land. If they disobey God, they go away from the promised land. And now they are about to enter and they influence the, the stand spies, they spread the news, we cannot enter in the promised land. What God has told us is not true. What Moses has told us is not true. So this is very, very contagious. Even in our church, whoever is allowed, sometimes, not all the time, I'm getting the influence of many. And we people, a member of the church, normally, without trusting in God, we don't consider the will of God, we go for the majority. We always will on the majority because whenever we are wrong or right, then we have a lot of people to, to share with. And that's what happened to Israelites. So this is a big lesson to each one of us. Even the big church, they experience the same problem. Whoever make a loud complaint, they influence the majority. That's it. That's it. Are you restless? Restlessness leads to rebellion. Rebellion leads to death. Remember this. Amen. Amen.
When Jimmy was a kid, his father fled to the border of a neighboring country chased by soldiers. His people, the Karen, were being persecuted. With help, Jimmy was eventually able to travel through the dense jungle to reunite with his father. Together, they journeyed to a refugee camp in Southeast Asia. Jimmy attended an Adventist school in the camp operated by Helen Hall, a missionary from Australia. When he graduated, she asked him to teach. One day while he was teaching, a visitor from the city promised to sponsor his education. He studied theology and later coordinated the work among the Karen, planting churches and setting up feeding centers, orphanages, and schools for Karen refugee and internally displaced children. Later, when his name came up for resettlement to the United States, he was sent to North Carolina. Within two years, he already had three budding Karen church plants and was finding Adventist Karen refugee families scattered across North America. There are about 80,000 Karen refugees in the United States. Many are just trying to adapt to a new way of living in a foreign land. Some have found refuge and support in the Adventist Church, especially while being able to worship with other Karen refugees. You know, like, I have more friends in church, in, like, Karen Church, so we can speak, like, Karen, and we can understand each other. And if we go to an uh, American church, and, like, we don't know how to speak, like, like, I mean, English, so, like, we don't understand each other. It is very important to worship in my language because we can understand our preaching or sharing gospel in, if we do it in our own language. It's important because, you know, the, the church member and the pastor, if they, we can communicate straight to each other, then that would be better. Because if they feel like needed help, they don't have to go to, you know, the interpreter and then the interpreter has to translate it to the pastor again because some of the personal problem we don't want to tell to the other person so we can just go straight to the pastor. Jimmy Shui pastors several Karen congregations in North Carolina and also serves as the Karen church planting consultant for the North American Division Adventist Refugee and Immigrant Ministries. Pastor Jimmy did many things for the Korean people. Number one is he tried to organize every scattered church members who came to the United States. Every three years we have a family campaign for them. Everywhere in the United States where we have a church, every family is coming together to have a fellowship. Unless he is planning this, we don't have a fellowship, you know. We just stay in our home states and we don't know each other. And also because of this, the young people are coming together, surfing more in the church. My favorite is like to be together and worship together, sing together. We love the way like Korean people do that because you know, it sounds good. Like when they sing, it sounds so good. And like, you know, because Jesus gave them the voice. The Karen Adventist believers across North America asked Pastor Jimmy to nurture and lead them, as many still are not yet fluent in English. Pastor Jimmy is planting churches among the Karen across this territory. This quarter, a portion of the 13th Sabbath offering will support refugee and immigrant ministry throughout the North American division. It will give the opportunity for other groups like this to come together it will also provide scholarships for them to get a valuable Adventist education. Please pray for groups like this. Pray that they find comfort in Jesus as they transition to life in a new land. Thank you for supporting the 13th Sabbath offering.
May we bow as prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to your prayer, we would like to thank you once again that we were able to study your word this morning. And as we apply this lesson with our daily lives, we ask you to continue to guide us with our second of the service, that we are able to give your word with truthfulness through your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.